Hey there, Invertebrate Zoology. I'm coming at you with another video um, right now, right here. And surprise, there's worms in it. This will maybe be the last time we talk about worms before we get to the bestest of all of the groups, which are the arthropods. Um, but let's talk about some real fun ones today before we get there. Okay, so this lecture is going to be a little longer than some of the other ones just because we're going to be covering four phyla in one lecture. Um, so before you watch this video, make sure that you go to Schoology and pull up your learning goals and um, fill out that study guide while you're watching the video. That'll probably be the best strategy for doing this. Um, these are just some real pretty pictures of the four groups we're going to talk about today. This one wasn't blue, but I had like a theme going on here, so I turned it blue. So let's talk a little bit about uh, their phylogenetic placement and how they're evolutionarily related to each other. Um, all of the, the four groups that we're going to talk about today are in a clade called Ecdysozoa with the arthropods. So this is this clade here. As we saw from that um, 2020 uh, phylogenomics paper, the relationships between these four groups are not completely resolved, but it looks like Phylum Priapolita is the outgroup um, and is the um, least related to the, these other four groups. And the defining features of the Ecdysozoa group are that they're all protostomes, and that's a term for the development that we talked about earlier. They have the development of the mouth first, as opposed to a deuterostome, which has the development of the mouth second. Um, and then they're also, they also go through something called ecdysis. And ecdysis is the process of molting an exterior coating or an exoskeleton. I'll repeat that one more time. Ecdysis is the process of molting an exterior coating or an exoskeleton. These four that we're going to talk about today don't have an exoskeleton per se, but they do have a cuticle that they can shed, and the mighty, mighty arthropods, my fave group that we're going to talk about, they do have an exoskeleton, which distinguishes them from the four we're going to talk about today. So the four we're going to talk about today, they have a cuticle. They don't really have an exoskeleton. Arthropods do have an exoskeleton, but all of those, all five of these phyla are in a group called the Ecdysozoa. Um, these four groups that we're going to talk about today are important for a bunch of different reasons. One is that they're really important in the ecosystems they live in. They're commonly used for research on development. Um, they're commonly used in research on natural products and bioprospecting. They're really important vectors of human health uh, or human diseases, not human health. Um, and one of them in particular, the tardigrades, have been used in the study of cryptobiosis, which we'll talk about later. And they're also important for agricultural science. So um, these might be much smaller than the arthropod group that we're going to talk about next, but still very important. And some of them are really, really freaking cool. So let's talk about nematodes first. Thought you were done with worms, but you're not. Here's some more worms for you. Um, these are what are typically referred to as the roundworms for the common name. Uh, most of them are pretty small, between 1 to 2 millimeters in length. This group is very, very underdescribed. There's probably, well, right now there's about 16,000 described species, but there are like a million more yet to be discovered and named, probably. They are everywhere. You, have, you can have tens of thousands of roundworms in a single cup of soil. They is all over the place. They can be terrestrial, they can be freshwater, they can be marine. Um, some of them are free-living heterotrophs, which, if you remember from Gen Bio, means they can't produce their own food. A lot of them are also external or internal parasites, and a lot of them impact uh, humans and human health pets, livestock, and crops. This right here is this crazy nematode that busts out of the butt of grasshoppers. And then this one we're going to talk about later is C. elegans, really important nematode. These nematodes from SpongeBob, I don't 
think her actually real name is his. So let's talk a little bit about some of their morphology and their anatomy. The defining features of the phylum Nematoda are, one of them are these amphids, um, which are paired anterior lateral sensory organs that open through the body wall via a pore. And I found this diagram here from this research paper that was looking at gene families showing um, where this amphid is anatomically placed within just um, this potato cyst nematode that lives inside potatoes. Um, their cleavage pattern that they have in development is kind of ambiguous, but for the most part, they're considered protostomes like the rest of the uh, phyla we're going to talk about today. They're bilaterally symmetrical. And one important note to make um, that helps distinguish them from a group we're going to talk about later and from annelids, which are other quote-unquote worms, is that they only have longitudinal muscles. They do not have circular muscles like annelids. So only longitudinal muscles and nematodes. They have a cuticle that they can shed, and they don't have um, circulatory or respiratory structures. They respire and exchange water through their cuticle, which is also very similar to the annelids. So the cuticle in most of the groups that we're going to talk about today is very thin and just allows for gas exchange right through that cuticle. Let's talk a little bit about their reproduction and development. Most of them exhibit sexual dimorphism, which means that the males and the females look different from each other. They're also, for the most part, gonochoristic or dioecious, which means they have separate sexes. Um, one really, really common uh, nematode that is really important for studies of biology is C. elegans that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, C. elegans has two distinct sexes. They have males and then they have what are termed hermaphroditic females that you can see here in this diagram. The hermaphrodites are what the males are going to mate with during sexual reproduction, but these females can also possess what's called an ovotestes. So this is a diagram from your textbook right here. It just labels it as ovary, but you should be labeling this as the ovotestes because all females um, of C. elegans are hermaphroditic. So for C. elegans, this ovary is an ovotestis, which when it's not reproducing sexually, is capable of making sperm just for self-fertilization. The, the zygotes that they produce are laid kind of like eggs into the environment, and they don't have any larval stage. They just pop out of their, egg, their um, zygotes looking like tiny little worms. Another um, important um, feature of nematodes is that they exhibit utility. This is when adults have a distinct number of cells, so they grow their cells by making their cells bigger, not via cell division. So most animals, if they want to get bigger, they divide their cells and they go through mitosis. Um, these guys don't do that. They have a, when, as soon as they're a full-grown adult, they got a distinct set number of cells those, they're not going to have any more cells. They just make those cells bigger in size, which is really cool. And that's called utile right here. I'm not entirely sure I'm pronouncing that right. So let's talk about some really important examples of nematodes. Um, right here on this slide are just three examples that infect humans and um, uh, are really can be really, really debilitating to human health. Um, so this is Ascaris. You all should know what that is because you dissect it in Gen Bio. Um, there's this other worm called Enterobius vermicularis. This is pinworms. Uh, how they're transmitted is really disgusting. <laughs> and then there's also guinea worms, which is a really, really debilitating disease and has a much more complicated transmission pathway that you can see here. I got all these diagrams from the CDC. If you're interested in learning more about guinea worms and pinworms, um, one of my favorite podcasts, Sawbones, has two very hilarious episodes about guinea worms and pinworms that you should definitely check out if you're um, into podcasts and human health. Uh, some other po some not podcast, <laughs> some other worms that uh, are important to us as. Humans 
are heartworms because they infect the pets that we love. Um, so if you've ever bought heartworm treatment for your dog, uh, that's a nematode. Another um, example of a nematode, this is one that infects sheep and can be really detrimental to um, uh, sheep farmers and their industry. And they can also infect crops. So nematodes are really cool in that they infect animals and they can um, infect plants and present plant diseases. These are just two examples of some uh, parasites of plants, nematode parasites of plants. This one here is a root knot nematode. Um, and then this one here is um, a nematode that called a sting nematode that lives in, in um, the roots of citrus trees. And so they can be debilitating to agriculture too. But they're not all bad. There are some beneficial nematodes. So um, if you watch my bonus video about biocontrol, using live beneficial nematodes to control other pests um, is called biocontrol. And you can use beneficial nematodes for biocontrol. So you can, this is a picture I just took off Amazon of some wormies you can buy on the internet. Uh, and they are predators to fungus gnat larvae, root aphids, thrips, subterranean mites, and more. And they'll help control those pests in your plants. Another one that is a very, very good worm is uh, Cenorabidites. I think I pronounced that right. I think I've been pronouncing it wrong my whole life. Cenorabidites elegans is a really, really important model organism for lots of different fields in biology. This is just a diagram here of their life stage. I I could pull up hundred, probably hundreds of thousands of papers that have been written studying C. elegans as a model organism. They are really, really important for um, biological studies. One, because they reproduce really quickly and they're really easy to keep in culture. So a lot of things we wouldn't know about basic fundamental biology and um, how genes work comes from C. elegans. So that's nematode worms. Now let's move on to one of my favorite groups, velvet worms, Finally, phylum onychophora. Um, they are just so ridiculously cute. Um, there's about 180 described species they're terrestrial, and all of them have this textured epidermis that you can see here in this picture, and that's what makes them appear velvety on the surface. Um, they are in the fossil record. They're considered their own group called the lobopods. Um, one example is Hallucigenia. That's a picture, a reconstruction of a fossil here. This is another reconstruction of the other fossil group. Um, one example of a lobopod fossil group. They are nocturnal, um, and they can be carnivores, they can be herbivores, um, or they can be omnivores. They usually live in humid, tropical, or temperate habitats in the southern hemisphere. Their cuticle is really thin, just like the other group that we talked about, so they need a high water environment. And if there's not water available in the environment, or if there's a drought, they'll burrow and hibernate during times of drought. The adults can actually molt several times, um, and one really cool feature that we're going to see some gifts of in a second is that they have these things called oral or slime papillae. Um, these are paired structures that they have near their head that um, attack prey or predators with a sticky slime. And then once they shoot it out, like Spider-Man, um, then they use their mandibles to bite the prey and inject poisons into them. So they're very fluffy and cute, but also very deadly. Oh, and they have mandibles that they use to chew up their prey if they're carnivores. So here's some crazy gifts of them shooting out this crazy sticky slime. Um, I'll post a video on Schoology for you to look at, but, but like a month and a half ago, Father Sean found a video of a velvet worm fighting a spider, and he would ask me every week, when I was gonna show y'all this video. So this is a gif from that video, so is this. Look at their crazy mandibles coming out of their weird mouth. I will share that video with you um, so you can watch it battle a spider. But basically they're the real life Spider-Man of the invertebrate world. 
because they shoot out this slime that then hardens on their prey. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of these defining features. One is that they have these specialized slime glands. Another feature is that they have the, the paired anterior oral slime papillae. So these are always up near their head, and there's always a pair of them that shoot them out like Spider-Man. They have a subcutaneous hemal channels, basically kind of like a circulatory system, and then they have a pair of mandibles that you can see coming out here. Um, they actually are, we haven't seen this since we were talking about the annelids, but they are homo, homonomous meter, metermeric, which means they have repeated segments, and they do have so you can see the repeated segments here, and then they have an obvious cephalization here, but for the most part, they're homonomous. Um, another thing that's really strange is that they have, like, a weird little kissy mouth with lips on it that their mandibles come out of. Um, they also, they have um, feet that are called lobopods that you can see moving here in this image. Each of these has a little tiny terminal claw on it that it uses to grasp the surface. Um, at the base of their antennae, this little ball that you see here, that's one of its um, eyes that it has. And then one unique feature about the onychophorans that distinguishes it from the rest of the groups I'm going to talk about today is that they have a tracheal system for respiration that attaches to these holes on the cuticle called spiracles. So the spiracles are an opening to the outside atmosphere that connect to trachea that allow them to respire. This is very similar to insects, but they are not closely related to insects, which you all know from that first paper I had you read about onychophorans and caterpillars. <laughs> um, a few notes on their reproduction. They are sexually dimorphic. Again, that means that the males and the females look different from each other. They, um, are dioecious, so they have separate sexes, and usually the males um, will deliver sperm to the females with a spermatophore. There's not a lot known about the reproduction, but what we do know um, is that they have the the males will produce a spermatophore, and then they'll just kind of place it randomly onto the skin of the females, and then it's absorbed through the skin of the females. This is one example of reproduction that we do know, um, but again, it's rarely been seen, and there is probably some infern internal fertilization too in some species, um, but it hasn't been documented. Some of them lay eggs, which means that they're oviparous, and then some of them will give live birth, which is what viviparous means, and some of them actually form a placental structure um, that protects the developing embryos. Um, some of them don't, and that's just in the viviparous ones. Look at that cutie. Look at his little antennas and his little eyeballs and his little lobopods. That one too. Okay, so that's the, the velvet worms. Now let's talk about another cutie in the invertebrate world, the tardigrades. And hopefully you've learned about these in gen bio as well. Um, these are, their common name are water bears. They are pretty small. They're about 0.5 millimeters long. They're found in humid or moist terrestrial microhabitats, but you can also find them in freshwater and marine aquatic systems. For the most part, they're free living, but some of them are epicommensals, which means they'll live like on the outside of animals, but they're not parasitic. They just kind of hitch a ride on them. And some of them are parasites. They, and a lot of them have really wide geographic ranges. Um, and that's because of their cryptobiosis, which we'll talk about in a second, and their uh, dispersal abilities. And this is from Beatrice the Biologist, one of my favorite biology cartoonists on the internet. I love this. And then I found this um, person on Etsy. If you want to buy these stickers, there's a link online. I think I might buy them all for our whole class because I think Survive and Thrive kind of describes how the rest of our semester is going to go. <laughs> and water bears are cute. So let's talk about what they look like. Um, some defining features are that they have four pairs of lobopod legs. They have those little poochy legs just like the onychophorans, and then they have pads or claws on the tips of them. They have a chitinous cuticle, and then they have oral stylets that protrude from their mouth. Uh, so in this gif you can see a little bit of 
um, that oral stylet coming out. And then this is an animation that is based on this real life SEM image of a water bear. Um, so this is the mouth with the oral stylets that protrude. Um, important thing to note about them is that where their mouth is placed can tell you a lot about what they actually feed on. If they have a ventral mouth that's on the undersurface of their body, then they likely feed on plants or algae or detritus. Um, so they, they're kind of like scraping with their mouth parts, a little bit like the radula of a snail, and that's if the mouth is ventral on the bottom side of the tardigrade. If their mouth is terminal and anterior, like it is in this SEM image and in this GIF here of this animation, then they're likely either omnivorous, where they'll eat both plants and animals, or they're carnivorous, where they are straight up meat eaters. A little more uh, notes on their morphology and their anatomy. They're bilaterally symmetrical. Um, they have a segmented body. They do have some cephalization, as you saw in those images before up here. They have large salivary glands that, that can replace the stylets in their mouth when they molt. Um, so there's its little mouth right there. Um, gas exchange, again, is directly across the cuticle. So Onycophorans are the only one that have any sort of complicated respiration system um, in these four that we're going to talk about today. And a lot of them possess um, these sensory bristles on the that aren't, they're not really, yeah, they're not illustrated in this picture here, but a lot of them possess um, these sensory bristles that are innervated, which means that they're connected to nerves, and that allows them to sense their environment, um, which is pretty cool. And then they also have... Um, near their brain, because even though they're real tiny, they even have their own little brain, they have an eye spot that helps them detect uh, light and dark. So let's talk about something real cool. Let's talk about anabiosis and cryptobiosis. Um, anabiosis is the scientific term for dormancy brought on by a change in environmental conditions. So it's basically um, when conditions get unfavorable going into a state of a state of suspended animation cryptobiosis is like anobiosis cranked up to 11 and this is a state of extreme dormancy where you just like turn into han solo in uh carbonite is that the name of that stuff oh i hope joey doesn't listen to this he's gonna be mad if i got that wrong is it carbonite Whatever it is. It's like Han Solo being frozen in time and in, in that stuff in Star Wars. That's what cryptobiosis is. Basically, um, in cryptobiosis, there is no detectable metabolism whatsoever. So they are completely suspended. But they can be revived. So they're not dead. They're just not doing anything at all. So when they go into anabiosis, they lose about 90% of their body water. And then they form into a cyst. Um... That cyst that they can form into actually does minimal metabolism, but when they're going into like cryptobiosis and cranking it up to 11, then there's no metabolism at all, and that's when they form a ton. So the cyst is the state of anabiosis where they're still doing minimal metabolism. They're basically just hibernating. A ton, which is this shape that you see here and here, is basically they scrunch themselves off and they turn off their power button. No metabolism whatsoever. But when the conditions become favorable again, they just pop back out into an active state, like nothing ever happened. Um, and because of this, scientists love doing horrible, terrible stuff to them to see if they can survive it. So um, a few of the things that have been done to tardigrades is they've been completely dried up, They've been frozen in liquid nitrogen. They've been heated at extreme heat. They've been deprived of oxygen. And they've even been launched into the vacuum of space. Um, they've also been ex exposed to space radiation. And they crunch up into their tons and they can survive all of it. They're just like little astronauts. Badass little astronauts. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about their reproduction and development um, before we finish up the tardigrades. They're dioecious, which means they have separate sexes. Um, for the most part, they have internal fertilization. Um, then they, after they reproduce, they lay their embryos in the, into the environment and they protect them with the last molt of the adult female. So when the female is laying the egg, she will also molt in that process and then use that chitinous molt to protect the eggs that she's laying. Um, terrestrial water bears, where they have to deal with lack of water, will... Um, create these really cool shells that are very, very resistant to desiccation. Um, and they are extremely beautiful. I found all these, these are all different pictures of different types of terrestrial water bear eggs. And these little projections help protect that egg um, from desiccation. They're very, very hardy and very, very beautiful. Um, another thing that uh, tardigrades exhibit is uh, utility. Again, that word means that the adults have a set number of cells as soon as they become a full-formed adult. And the way that they grow and get bigger is that their cells get bigger. They do not do cell division at that point. So one more group before we move on to the mighty, mighty arthropods. Let's talk about the Priapolita. Um, these are, there's only about 20 described extant species of these, um, so they're not very diverse currently, but they were very, very diverse in the Paleozoic about 540 million years ago. They're benthic, um, and they're marine, and as you can see in these pictures, they are vermiform. They look like little worms. They have three separate body sections. They have an introvert, uh, which is bulbous and spiky and scaly. They have a collar at the top, and then they have a trunk. And then those are the three body sections that all of them have. And then some of them have a caudal appendage at the end. Um, they, are uns they may have like these banding patterns on the outside, but they are unsegmented. Um, they have circular and longitudinal muscles, which makes them... Um, sort of similar to annelids in morphology, not uh, evolutionarily. They're not closely related to annelids compared to these other groups, but they do have circular and longitudinal muscles. Um, the name of the group comes from the Greek god of reproduction, Priapos, uh, and I will let you draw your own conclusions as to why somebody gave them that name. Um, when they feed on their prey, the introvert everts and a bit of the pharynx extends through the mouth to reveal cuticular teeth that will grab their prey. So this is a little similar to um, the way that ribbon worms work where they have an internal structure that's everted, has um, some spikes on it that then help pull the prey into their mouth. This group exchanges gases through the cuticle like... Um, all the other groups that we talked about except for the onychophorans. Um, but it's also thought that they might use this caudal appendage that some of them have um, for gas exchange as well. They're dioecious, so they have separate sexes. Um, unlike most of the groups we've talked about in this lecture so far, they're broadcast spawners with external fertilization. And then they have a free living larval stage. Um, here's some pictures of what the different larval stages look like in a few of the currently living species of Priapolita. Um, so that's another thing that distinguishes them um, from some of the other groups that we've talked about. And that's it. Finito, the end. Um, I will see you next time uh, when we talk about arthropods. Bye-bye.